These patrols are happening every single night this month, and they were just shot at earlier tonight. Is there a U.S. influence in Brazil's gun culture? 100%. We ready? What percentage of guns coming into Mexico do you think come through the actual border crossing checkpoints? You see how easy it is, right? I would say almost all of them. This is not just about access to firearms. This is about building political constituencies. We can still see remains of the bullet. Do you feel like you're in a war zone sometimes? Yes. Right now, we're in the mountains of Sinaloa, Mexico. I'm in southern Brazil. We're in San Pedro Sula. Argento! More than 44,000 people died because of guns in the U.S. last year. That's the size of a small city, wiped out because it's so easy to buy weapons here. But that number doesn't come close to capturing the level of violence that we as a country are responsible for, because America's guns aren't just staying in America. For nearly a year, we followed the iron pipeline of weapons flowing from the U.S. into Latin America, meeting cartel members in Mexico, police officers in Honduras, and pro-gun activists in Brazil to investigate how American guns and our gun culture are spreading throughout the region and fueling violence far beyond our borders. Some of this report contains scenes of violence that are tough to watch. Right now, we're in the mountains of Sinaloa, Mexico. This is cartel territory. We're driving up to meet a group of armed people associated with the cartel. The Sinaloa cartel is one of Mexico's most powerful drug trafficking organizations, shipping cocaine, meth, and fentanyl around the globe. But we're not here to talk about drugs. Tell me about the rifle that you have in front of you right now. What is it? It's an AK-47. This is the rifle from the Estados Unidos. How do you know that? An entire arsenal of AK-47s, AR-15s, and pistols is readily available north of the border, along with other weapons of war, like Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifles. Are these bullets on your chest there from a Barrett? Sí, estos son de 50. ¿Gusta verlo? Sí. You can't get these in Mexico. It's, it's hard, right? Pues está muy caro, ya. Te sale mejor traerlo en Estados Unidos porque usted sabe que todo viene de allá. If you're buying the, the Barrett rifle from the United States, how much does one of those cost you? Wow. If you had to guess, how many Barrett's 50 calibers are out there in Sinaloa right now? Why the Barrett 50 caliber? The Barrett 50 caliber has become a weapon of choice for Mexican cartels. During the recent capture of El Chapo's son, Video Guzman, cartel gunmen used 50 calibers in a fierce firefight with the military. The Mexican government suspects these guns came from the U.S., just some of the 200,000 weapons estimated to be trafficked every year into Mexico and then on to other parts of Latin America. Here in Mexico, at least 350,000 people have been murdered or disappeared since 2006. Official stats link at least 70% of the guns used in crimes here back to dealers or manufacturers in the U.S. Can you tell me about the process of, of just getting the guns from the U.S. to Sinaloa? How does it work? What do you think about the gun laws in the United States that makes it so easy to have all these stores and anyone can just walk in and buy basically whatever they want? This is the Barrett 50 caliber. We ready? This rifle was seized from cartel traffickers on the way to Mexico. It's being fired by an agent from the ATF, which enforces U.S. gun laws. You could feel the, the concussion hit me in the chest. Oh, wild. 
50 calibers like this one can punch through armored steel plates and hit targets from over a mile away. I can't imagine that without having the ears on. Cartel gunmen have even used these weapons to take down a military helicopter. Fred Milanowski leads the ATF's office in Southeast Texas, a hub for cartel gun smuggling. The 50 cal is legal to buy in the United States. Now they, they go upwards of eight to $10,000. So, uh, you know, they're not being sold to a lot of people, but as the law currently stands, they are not illegal to own in the United States. How quickly are guns that are being bought and trafficked across the border turning up at crime scenes in Mexico? I mean, we've seen as quick as less than one week. Um, that's a pretty direct pipeline. So if I find somebody who wants to sell me their 50 caliber rifle in a parking lot somewhere, I can do that transaction in cash and you at the ATF have no idea that that gun has changed hands. That is correct. There are no background checks that get done when it's a person-to-person -person sale. So those unlicensed dealers can buy 10, 15, 20 rifles and law enforcement has zero visibility on that. Is that a problem? Yeah, of course, right? There's no tracking and there's no requirement for them to even identify the individual, much less keep any records. If I bring a bag full of cash into a gun store and buy, you know, 40 AK-47s, does that store obligated to report that to the ATF? It is if it's in one of the four border states. Okay, so if I want to buy 40 rifles, I just got to drive a little bit farther north to Oklahoma, and then that reporting obligation goes away. That is true. That is true. We know that narcotics are going north, being converted into cash. And these cartels have a challenge, right, to get this bulk cash back down south, so they're spending some of it on rifles. To smuggle those rifles across the border, cartels rely on corruption. What that actually looks like is rarely seen by the public. But Vice News obtained this exclusive footage from 2016 that shows exactly how it's done. At a border checkpoint between Texas and Mexico, a man in a green shirt has parked this white truck. These are Mexican customs agents. But as you can see, they notice something that makes them back off pretty quickly. A red truck appears. The guy in green puts on body armor, and the drivers start unloading guns into the red truck, including what looks like a 50 caliber and other high-powered rifles. Finally, both men jump into the red truck and take off into Mexico, abandoning the white truck, which turned out to be stolen. The whole operation happened in broad daylight, and it takes less than two minutes. And that is how weapons enter Mexico. And this is not a hit on any government official in Mexico. To their defense, those border agents right there in Mexico are unarmed. Uh, and these, these are cartel traffickers. Look at these guys, they don't seem afraid of anything, right? And they sure don't. So. From 2018 to 2022, Tim Sloan was the top ETF official in Mexico where he helped trace at least 97,000 illegal guns back to the U.S. So what percentage of guns coming into Mexico do you think come through the actual border crossing checkpoints like we're seeing in this video? Oh, I would say almost all of them. I mean, do you see, do you see how easy it is, right? Why would you do it any other way? Trafficked weapons from the U.S. end up with groups like the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, responsible for some of the most high-profile attacks in Mexico. In 2020, dozens of the cartel's gunmen tried to assassinate Mexico City's police chief in one of the capital's wealthiest neighborhoods. A massive gunfight left two bodyguards and a bystander dead, and the police chief badly wounded. It happened right on this street corner. This is Beverly Hills, right? This yeah. is the Beverly Hills of Mexico and you have 50 armed men attacking the police chief yeah. near the home of the United States ambassador. Really quite remarkable. How many rounds do you think were fired in this exchange? Holy shit, well, there were 37 guns seized. Five 50 calibers. Is five 50 caliber rifles like a normal thing in a shootout or is that even a it's, lot of firepower for an attack in Mexico? That's, that's the firepower of the height of the war in, uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan. Sloan and his team were able to track all the weapons recovered at the crime scene back to the U.S. How did you know that those weapons came from the United States? We were able to get access to the weapons within hours of the event, and we were able to recover the serial numbers and identify the buyers. Many of those weapons came back to people that were already under investigation by ATF. 
out of Phoenix, out of Houston, out of Dallas. So potentially 62 people will go to the penitentiary for sending those weapons to Mexico. It was a great example of what we can do here in Mexico if we had the support. The ambassador now has things that he finds important. Unfortunately, firearms is no longer at the top of those priorities. It sounds like you're saying that in terms of investigating, gun smuggling, gun running, there's just not the resources that there needs to be to make a difference. Well, there's not the resources in ATF as a whole, right? We're one of the smallest agencies in the country. We have 2,500 special agents in the entire world. I think the FBI has that in New York City. There's a lot of gun crime in America and very few ATF agents to handle it all. And Mexico, sadly, was not a top priority. Vice News obtained exclusive data that shows hundreds of 50 caliber guns were recovered in Mexico over the last six years. These illegally trafficked rifles came from stores and dealers across the U.S. These weapons are not for sale to the Mexican public. Neither are assault rifles. In fact, the country's gun laws are among the most strict in the Western Hemisphere, with just one gun store in all of Mexico. There's only one for the whole country. Si así es la Dirección de Comercialización de Armamento y Municiones, es la única instalación en donde se puede adquirir armas y municiones de manera legal en nuestro país. It kind of looks like the DMV. It might even be more bureaucratic. Civilians, cops, the National Guard, they're all required to get their guns from this shop. Buying a weapon here requires a background and mental health check, a waiting period of a couple weeks, and registration so the military can track who owns what. Hay límites en el número de armas que una persona pueda comprar? Sí, una para toda oh, la vida. Wow. La ley establece precisamente que es un arma a ah, domicilio. Wow. Es un arma que puede puede adquirir. Okay. Y establece los calibres que puede adquirir. Ajá, ajá. Únicamente se le son autorizados la adquisición de pistolas no superiores al calibre de 380 y en el caso de revólver no superiores al calibre 38 especial. En Estados Unidos hay gente que tiene más de 100 armas en su casa. Sí, es una, es una distancia muy grande, ¿no? The Mexican government estimates that up to 90% of the guns recovered at crime scenes here come from U.S. stores and dealers. They've sued five gun stores in Arizona and filed a separate lawsuit targeting companies like Barrett, alleging they're turning a blind eye toward purchases by cartel traffickers. Alejandro Solorio is the lead attorney in these unprecedented cases. Part of your allegation here is that the U.S. laws around guns have had a direct impact on violence in Mexico. How do you know they're related? In Mexico, solo existe un lugar donde puedes comprar armas de manera legal. Y en ese lugar no se venden estas armas de tal poder de fuego. Y las armas que son importadas legalmente por el ejército, según cifras de ATF, eh, es menor del 3% de las que se encuentran en escenas del crimen. Eso nos deja ver, según publicaciones de ATF, que entre el 70 y el 90% de las armas que utilizan los criminales provienen de los Estados Unidos de manera ilícita. There are Americans out there who are going to say it is the responsibility of Mexico to control your border and prevent these guns from being smuggled illegally into your country. Definitivamente es nuestra responsabilidad de tener el flujo irregular de armas desde los Estados Unidos como es responsabilidad del gobierno estadounidense impedir el flujo de personas y de drogas. Lo que queremos es que las empresas se hagan responsables porque hasta el momento no han hecho nada para ayudar a que el tráfico ilícito disminuya. In the lawsuit you chose eight companies. Some of them are big companies, but there's one small one in there. Barrett Rifles. Ha habido un incremento en el número de armas Barrett que se encuentran en escenas del crimen del de en México. Estas industrias facilitan el tráfico ilícito y al mismo tiempo le venden legalmente a los gobiernos para responder a esas mismas armas. Entonces es un negocio redondo donde por mi negligencia facilito el problema y al mismo tiempo presento la solución. Barrett did not respond to multiple requests for comment. In response to Mexico's lawsuit, attorneys for the company called the claim that it fuels violence in Mexico nothing more than speculative, conclusory, and estimated allegations. Mexico's case against the gunmakers has already been dismissed, but they're currently appealing. Mexico's other pending case also faces an uphill battle, since U.S. laws are designed to protect gun sellers. Is there anything that we 
the United States as a country could do that would make a dramatic impact and significantly cut back the flow of weapons to Mexico? If we had universal background checks, obviously we would have a better chance of keeping hands out of prohibited people. What's stopping that from happening? Well, so you're seeing the same news that I'm seeing, right? It's been, you know, the, it's been discussed and debated, um, you know, for more than a decade. Seems like a no-brainer, but politics get in the way. I'll, I'll leave the politics up to you guys. Congress did pass gun control legislation in 2022 that for the first time specifically outlaws gun trafficking. But it's still easy for people to buy guns like the Barrett 50 caliber with no background check. And Republicans want to make sure it stays that way. Far-right leaders like Marjorie Taylor Greene have turned the 50 cal into a symbol of freedom. This is a campaign ad using a Barrett rifle to rally her supporters. In 2022, I'm going to blow away the Democrat socialist agenda. Vice News contacted a half dozen Republican leaders about illegal gun trafficking in the U.S. The only statement in response came from Taylor Greene. Her spokesperson called the idea that the U.S. is responsible for gun violence in Mexico, quote, an absolutely ridiculous premise. If in the future the U.S. changes its gun laws and makes it harder, are you worried that you won't be able to get the guns you want anymore? What do you think people in the United States should know about you and your group? Trafficked weapons like pistols and assault rifles used by Mexican cartels eventually make their way further south into Central America. In Honduras, where thousands are murdered each year, gangs are often better armed than the police. We're just outside San Pedro Sula, where police have found a body thrown on the side of the road. This is a pretty common occurrence here. And even though we don't know what's happened yet because the forensics team hasn't arrived, almost all of these types of murders are gang-related. When a body is covered like this, it usually means that the person has been mutilated. No one can touch the body until the forensics team comes. Homicides are a daily reality in Honduras, where more people are killed per capita than almost any other country in the world. The violence stems from decades of poverty and corruption, which has allowed criminal gangs to thrive. Today, they rely on a steady flow of weapons from the U.S. to not only compete with, but often even outgun the police. In December of 2022, the government began a months-long crackdown all over the country, increasing police presence in gang-controlled areas and granting them broad authority to search people and homes and confiscate illegal guns. We're in San Pedro Sula with the National Police. Right now, they're red zones, places where gangs control neighborhoods that are all under curfew from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. These patrols are happening every single night this month, and they were just shot at earlier tonight, something that they say has been happening daily. They're going basically door to door through this entire apartment complex, making sure that no one's hiding anyone or anything. Meanwhile, there are families sitting outside watching, kids running around, everyone's just watching what's going on. For Hondurans living in gang-controlled communities like this one, everyday life has come to an abrupt halt. 
constant police operations, and a strictly enforced state of emergency affect everyone who lives here, criminal or not. But police say this is necessary to disband gangs and remove high-powered weapons from the streets. Since December, the Honduran National Police say they've arrested over 800 gang members and confiscated more than 700 firearms. Sí, se han decomisado armas de grosso calibre, como ser AR-15, AK-47 y M16. Lastimosamente, el destino de todas estas armas que ingresan de manera ilegal al país eh, son para las estructuras de crimen organizado. Y con esta, pues estas eh, amedrentan a la ciudadanía y, en eh, cierta manera, pues también nos complican el, el trabajo a nosotros. Veo que todos andan con rifles, es porque los delincuentes tienen armas potentes. Claro, claro que sí. El, las armas que nosotros usamos son de uso eh, semiautomático. Esto verdaderamente afecta ¿verdad? a lo que es la, la seguridad humana de, 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 un, de un estado como tal, pero pues eh, como policía estamos haciendo nuestro trabajo a nuestro nivel y estamos tratando ¿verdad? de erradicar este tipo de situaciones. Honduras es un país que sin estar en guerra tiene tantas muertes violentas y se vuelve un problema porque cuando hablamos de muertes por causa externa, el homicidio ocupa el primer lugar. People like Migdonia Ayestas, who study Honduras' violence epidemic, see the issue as a gun problem. The Observatory of Violence, where Ayestas works, recently found that around 80% of all murders committed here between 2005 and 2021 involved a firearm. ¿Por qué hay tantas armas de fuego aquí en este país? Se nos ha vendido la idea de que las armas de fuego brindan seguridad. ¿De dónde viene esa idea de que las armas de fuego brindan seguridad? Obviamente viene de los países que producen las armas porque necesitan vender armas y Estados Unidos es uno de ellos. It's widely known that the United States is the biggest arms supplier. But the exact number of guns that come here from the U.S. is hard to quantify because there's limited cooperation between Honduran police and the ATF. In 2021, the most recent year for which data is available, 62% of the guns that ATF traced here led back to the U.S. In the States, when we talk about, for example, about violence in countries like Honduras, we don't talk about the responsibility that a country like the States has in creating these weapons. Sin duda eh, es, es frustrante porque son leyes muy laxas las nuestras y que nuestros gobiernos tampoco eh, eh, ayudan a que eh, tengan estos países que producen las armas la responsabilidad que corresponde. En the country's hospitals, which are chronically under-resourced and overwhelmed, doctors don't have time to worry over the roots of the gun epidemic. Tenemos a alguien trauma ahí, Buenas. Hola. Permiso, madre. ¿Cómo? Se escucha mucho mejor. ¿Verdad? Se... Siente la diferencia. Ok. So actually, while we're looking here, this was a patient that received a gunshot right here. We can still see remains of the bullet. This is a, a nine millimeter. That's what we think. If he was shot with, say, like an AR-15, he will probably will bleed to death before arriving to the to the emergency. So the type of bullet, the type of gun, is the difference between arriving at the hospital, being treated, leaving alive, and yes. arriving dead on on the scene. Yeah. Yes. How frequently would you say that happens? Uh, like once or twice, uh, every two nights, every three nights. Do you feel like you're in a war zone sometimes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Totally. In Choloma, a small city outside of San Pedro Sula that's controlled by rival gangs, a group of women is trying to fight the normalization of all the gun violence by providing various forms of support to survivors. Nosotras aquí estamos porque mucha gente cree que solo que nos peguen un machetazo, nos peguen un tiro, nos vuelen la cabeza, es violencia. No, uno se sienta solo y él sabe que estamos para servir. Virtually every member of the women's organization, which is called Momukla, has been directly targeted by one of the gangs or indirectly affected by the constant turf wars. 
including Melania Reyes, who runs it. Nosotras nos impactamos de ver cuánto niño es reclutado en nuestro municipio, de chicos de 10 años que andan con esos animales que hasta se caen ellos con esas grandes armas. Y acá los chicos andan esas armas como que andar cualquier confite en la bolsa. ¿Cómo les afecta a los que viven acá cuando estos grupos van de deteniendo machetes, atendiendo como hoy en día tienen armas potentes, armas automáticos, R15. La gente tiene mucho miedo, mucho temor. La gente no sale y si sale tiene miedo que los van a asaltar, los van a matar. Reyes's frustration stems from a near-death experience she had about a decade ago when she was caught in a gunfight between rival gangs. Y ellos bajaron de acá y la otra venía de allá para acá. Y yo estoy ahí en medio, y a donde están esas tienditas, ahí fue, ahí fue deshecho todo eso. Todo eso fue deshecho. Era, ¿Cuántas balas diría? Pero como cinco minutos de, de metralletas que... Eran metralletas que se... Dios mío, yo... A la vez cuando me acuerdo, me... me que, es algo que que, que me, me hace revivir cosas que, que, que fue bien difícil, pues, porque vimos, vimos oh, eh, es lo fuerte, pues, cómo, cómo mataron a nuestros, a nuestros pobladores, a nuestros mismos compañeros, a nuestros amigos, que nos vimos crecer desde niños por esas armas que han venido a adentrar a nuestro país. One of the other survivors was Reyes's friend Elga Alba Murillo, who was pregnant at the time. Fue herida dónde? El impacto me cayó cerca del pulmón derecho, aquí. En ese momento no me pudieron operar por mi embarazo, porque yo no quería perder a mi hijo. Yo aquí tengo introducida todavía la bala. Tengo problemas para respirar. No le puedo dormir boca arriba, sí, ni con una almohada. Ni le puedo dormir boca abajo. Cuando yo le duermo boca abajo siento como que me punza algo así. Y ahí perdió la vida el padre de mi hijo porque él le cayó una bala perdida y él ni murió en el momento. En ese momento, pues, yo no pensaba en mí y no que pensaba en, en el padre de mi hijo porque lo miré tirado que él estaba ahí muerto. Fue un trauma bien, bien, me da cosa ponerme a pensar. Moving on is especially difficult here because the threat of violence is ongoing. Every day, Alba Murillo and her son make pupusas right around the corner from where they almost died. Crear un niño acá en una comunidad donde hay tantas armas, ¿cómo cómo uno cuida a sus sus hijos? Uno los encomienda a Dios. Eso es lo único que nos queda. La gente acá hablan de de esa realidad, de que muchas de estas armas vienen de los Estados Unidos. Sí, se habla de que pues el armamento grande viene de allá, de Centroamérica, de Estados Unidos. Pienso que no les importa la vida de nosotros como hondureños. No la quieren ver. Se hacen lo, como, como los locos. Sería una alegría para todos que no existieran esas armas, pero lamentablemente, pues, como le digo, siguen llegando. Por eso le puse angelito, porque es mi ángel. American guns aren't the only things crossing our southern border. Our gun culture is also going with them. During Brazil's elections in October, we witnessed the growing influence of a pro-gun movement that is inspired by America's NRA. And one day, you could be just as powerful. On January 8th, thousands of supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro stormed Brazil's Congress, Supreme Court, and Presidential Palace. In scenes strikingly similar to the invasion of the U.S. Capitol, they left a trail of destruction. For months leading up to this moment, 
we followed one group of diehard Bolsonaro supporters, pro-gun activists. They've emerged as a powerful political force, and they're determined to bring America's love of guns to Brazil. Cadê a calibre 12? Tá aqui. Bora lá. Vamos tocar, Léo. Olha o filhote, ele parou. Olha lá. Olha o filhote, olha o filhote. Olha lá o filhote, olha o filhote. Olha o filhote. Marjageu Silvio França Filho is a social media star. His post of wild boar hunts on Instagram have attracted tens of thousands of followers who know him as Samurai Caçador or Samurai Hunter. Bandido! Bora vem caçar com os samurai. Porra, que bonito. Wow, that was an experience. Is it nice? I what are you feeling? I don't know if I would call it nice. <laughs> but are you happy? Um, I'm happy for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> guns are more than just a hobby for Casador. He wants gun rights to be enshrined in Brazilian law, just like they are in the U.S. Vejo que agora é o momento de lutar pela nossa bandeira. When we met Casador, he was among a slate of pro-gun candidates running in the October elections. Eu quero ter o direito de poder defender a minha família. Voz é por armas. Por que se não pôr agora? Quando será? Nós, brasileiros, temos os Estados Unidos como uma referência de liberdade. Eu sou um cara, como qualquer outro brasileiro, que se filia e é afiliado ao ProArmas e vê ali como uma maneira de se organizar para poder buscar direitos. O que você vê como o long-term future of the pro-gun movement. Ter a possibilidade de a gente colocar pessoas e representantes armamentistas verdadeiros é, faz com que a gente possa lá na frente garantir através de leis, garantir uma segurança jurídica que possa ser passada pelas futuras as futuras gerações que estão chegando. There is no right to bear arms in Brazil's constitution. But former president Jair Bolsonaro made gun access central to his 2018 campaign. After taking office in 2019, he signed over 40 executive orders, rolling back Brazil's strict firearms regulations. Under his watch, the number of registered gun owners grew sixfold. Southern Brazil, one of Latin America's biggest gun conventions. There's a lot of people here, companies from all over the world, including American companies, and it's just a scene. Samurai Casador is also here as a featured speaker. Sem volta. Exatamente. Isso só tende a crescer. Isso aqui não é projeto para um ano. Isso aqui é projeto para 10, 20 anos. Isso é para vida. Parabéns, Samurai. How does the event this year compare to last year's event? Oh, esse evento esse ano ele está cada vez maior, né? Uh -huh. Eu acredito que dentro de 10 anos vai aumentar muito. Na verdade, nós lutamos para que independente do governo que exista, se seja um governo de esquerda ou de direita, a, a pauta armamentista se permaneça. Brazilians still only have around 4 million firearms compared to the US's 393 million. But the recent spike in gun owners here means the potential market is huge. And it's being driven by people like George Washington de Oliveira Souza. This is it? He's a licensed collector. And in the last few years, he spent more than $30,000 building an arsenal. We found him buying a US-made semi-automatic rifle. How many guns do you have? Aí eu tenho uns 26 armas. Wow. Período, um curto período atrás, eu tinha só três armas. When did you start buying all these new guns? Outubro de 2021. You purchased 26 guns since October of last year? Sim. Do you need 26 guns? Não, mas é paixão. Before Bolsonaro, could you own this gun? Não. You couldn't? Não. Nunca. Nosso presidente hoje é um presidente armamentista, então eu acho que isso traz mais segurança para o nosso país. 
Os bandidos hoje estão tá sabendo que o cidadão de bem hoje está armado. Se esse argumento sounds familiar, that's because it's straight from the NRA playbook, featured again and again in NRA ads. That's right, we're the good guys with guns they talk about. The only truly free people who have ever walked this earth have been armed people. I'm the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. The NRA has a history in Brazil. Before 2005, the gun movement here was all but dead. Luis Inácio Lula da Silva was president then, and he backed a referendum asking voters to ban gun sales to civilians altogether. I think it's a pass in the intention of improving the security of the public. You're going to have to be armed, everyone's going to be armed. Then you're going to have to be a far west, right? The NRA took notice, so it helped Brazil's gun lobby strategize and fight back. No, I don't open the door of my liberty. Voters were flooded with television and radio ads about personal freedom, just like in the U.S. My life is just starting. There's already people who want to mess with my rights. Against the prohibition. Vote you. Vote no. The campaign worked. Voters overwhelmingly rejected the ban. The idea that civilians ought to have a right to an arm, that is a purely imported argument. Robert Mugga has been studying arms control in Brazil for a decade. Is there a U.S. influence in Brazil's gun culture? 100%. Brazilian gun culture, to some extent, has been invented and imported by U.S. gun advocates. The NRA came to Brazil to support the pro-arms campaign, bringing a discourse that had never been seen before in Brazil. Why does the NRA care about Brazil, and why would the NRA care about Brazil? Make no mistake, the NRA understands the importance of international rules that could affect domestic interests at home. This is not just about access to firearms. This is about building political constituencies. I think what the Bolsonaro family understand is that this is a voting bloc. This is a constituency they can tap for future elections, and they've been doing that very successfully. Under Bolsonaro, Brazil's pro-gun movement turned into a political powerhouse. It's led by pro-armas, a lobby group founded in 2020 that's modeled after the NRA. They organized this campaign rally back in July with Bolsonaro's son, Eduardo, as a keynote speaker. Has the NRA, the National Rifle Association, yep. contributed to your father's campaign? With money, no. No, no, no. But we, we have the same thing. I love NRA. And a couple of years ago, I even made a donation to NRA because I do appreciate the work that the United States did. And here we are building our NRA. For you, as United States, like the ideal? Sure, yes. United States is much safer than Brazil. And you think guns will make people safer? Brazil is showing to all of the world that with more legal guns, you have less crimes. This idea that more guns equals less crime became a rallying cry for the pro-gun movement. Homicide rates did fall by some 30% since 2017, a statistic Bolsonaro said was proof that guns make people safer. But the reasons why are disputed. Many criminologists attribute it to a temporary truce between gangs, among other factors. And other kinds of crimes, like violent bank robberies, are on the rise, especially in the state of Sao Paulo. Wow, this is just a closet full of, of guns. Chief Pedro Ivo Correa Santos says all these guns were seized during bank attacks. What kind of gun is this? This is a U.S. rifle, AR-15, Argentina, Belgium. 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 Guns have long circulated illegally in Brazil, trafficked in from other countries. What changed under Bolsonaro is that gangs could access high-powered weapons through license buyers on the legal market. That's a Brazilian gun, but it's a shotgun. Probably it was legal gun in the past. So it's probably sold to a hunter or a yes. sport shooter. Yes. Do you worry that guns sold legally in Brazil will end up in the hands of criminals? Yes, because, you know, more guns on the streets will be more guns on criminal hands. Is there a reason that you think that collectors need these kinds of guns? I don't know why. 
These guns are criminal guns. I don't know why someone want to buy a gun like this. Legal guns are already spilling into the illegal market. In dozens of cases, police have accused licensed gun owners of arming Brazil's most notorious gangs. Brazil is already the homicide capital of the world. By introducing this new equipment into the markets, both the legal and then into the illegal markets, we created a problem for Brazil that's going to last generations. Does the pro-gun movement end with Bolsonaro? I think Pandora's box has been opened and I don't see this going back. With or without Bolsonaro, we're going to be seeing the pro-arms movement continuing in its influence far after he's gone. Bolsonaro lost the election by a hair, less than 2% of the vote. Samurai Casador also lost. He joined thousands of other Bolsonaro loyalists in protest, calling for a military intervention. On December 24th, Souza, the gun collector we interviewed at the convention, was arrested for attempting to set off a bomb in Brasilia. During his arrest, police seized a thousand rounds and eight firearms, including the one he showed us. A week later, Lula took office and immediately revoked some of Bolsonaro's gun decrees. O Brasil não quer e não precisa de armas na mão do povo. But Bolsonaro's party and right-wing allies won control of Congress, expanding what's been dubbed the Bullet Caucus. Pro-gun lawmakers promised to pick up where Bolsonaro left off and ensure his U.S.-inspired gun legacy lives on. I don't see a sombrio destino for the armamentista brasileiro. I believe that the arms should remain in society. The light was applied to the armamentista. And many people Querem ser. Up and down Latin America, we heard the same thing. American weapons and gun culture are spreading like a virus, endangering innocent people all across the region. The question is, how much blood needs to be shed before the United States owns up to its role in fueling the violence and finally starts taking the issue seriously? 